Hey guys, my name is Max, and welcome to Simple Biology. In this video, we're going to start talking about the membrane, specifically about its structure and how that plays a role in the cell. Now, if you've ever taken a biology class, or even seen a diagram of a cell, you know that the cell membrane is one of the most prominent features of a cell. In fact, that membrane is one of the defining characteristics of, of life as we know it, especially because it allows a cell to maintain different chemical environments inside and outside of the membrane which is going to be hugely important when we talk about biology. Before we get into how a cell, a cell or how membranes work, we have to kind of discuss uh, what makes up a membrane. So the molecule that makes up a membrane is called a phospholipid. A phospholipid is basically made, made up of a couple different components. Uh, these are two fatty acids, which are uh, this little group right here. Each of these is a fatty acid up to that oxygen molecule a glycerol molecule, which is this little chain in the middle, and a phosphate group, which is up here at the end. And all these different components combine together to make up a phospholipid. You may never need to know these, but it can be very important, or it can be very helpful, especially when we start talking about the chemistry of why phospholipids work the way they do. Now, the, um, of, of course, the function of a phospholipid is to make up the cell's membrane. The way they do this is that they arrange together in a double layer with their tails on the inside. This arrangement is called the phospholipid bilayer. Essentially, a double layer with, made up of phospholipids. It looks a little bit like this diagram right here. You can see there's the phosphate uh, and glycerol heads, and then uh, tail-looking things that are these hydrocarbon chains. Now, um, the reason it, it, it'll, uh, it'll group up like this, it'll arrange like this, is because phospholipids are amphipathic. Now, amphipathic is a word that means it's got a hydrophobic part and a hydrophilic part. If you uh, need a reminder of, of what hydrophobic and hydrophilic mean and how that works, go check our chemistry unit and we go into a little bit more detail there. Essentially, this, these chains are made out of very uh, non-polar bonds, which means that they're hydrophobic. While this phosphate group has a charge on it, which makes it hydrophilic. Because of this, this phosphate group, the head, will want to uh, be near water, will want to combine with water and other hydrophilic uh, substances, whereas these tails, these hydrocarbon regions, will want to be in, uh, in a location with other um, nonpolar, other hydrophobic uh, components. This arrangement right here puts all the nonpolar, all the hydrophobic uh, parts next to each other, while leaving all the polar and all the polar charged and uh, hydrophilic sections outside of that area where the water is going to be. There's a lot of water on either side of this. Um, the entire cell is, is in aqueous solution. So that's kind of how phospholipids work. Um, but their, their movement is going to be just as important with a cell's membrane. Um, especially later we're going to be talking about fluidity of a membrane and how that's one of its uh, most important um, uh, most, most important qualities, one of its most important uh, attributes. But the reason these phospholipids move is because they're only bound together by weak uh, interactions, not by actual bonds. So um, they'll, uh, there's two types of movement, a lateral movement and what's called a flip-flop movement. There's not really a good word for it. But lateral movement is very frequently, uh, sometimes up to 10 million flip-flops per second. Like, um, it'll, it, one phospholipid will switch places with another. So this happens very frequently, and that, that's what makes a membrane so fluid. Whereas they very rarely uh, switch sides or uh, flip-flop across from each other. Although there's an enzyme called flipase, a group of enzymes called flipases, and these allow phospholipids to cross over. So that's kind of how ph phospholipids move. We're not going to move into fluidity of a membrane as a whole. There are a couple different factors that, inc uh, that influence the fluidity of a membrane. Um, the first we're going to look at is, um, is temperature. Now, like I said, fluidity is the movement of those phospholipids within the membrane. They allow the membrane to be more flexible, and as they move, the membrane as a whole moves. Now, fluidity, like I said, is uh, one of the factors is temperature, but fluidity increases directly with temperature. In other words, as the temperature increases, the fluidity also increases, so the, the membrane becomes more fluid. 
This is because, uh, if you remember, temperature is a measure of the movement of different uh, of different molecules and uh, other uh, components. But because those uh, because those phospholipids are reaching a higher temperature, they're going to be moving more because again, temperature is a measure of their mo motion. Because they're moving more that's going to make the membrane more fluid. On the, on the other hand, as they get colder, they'll start moving less, again, because that temperature is decreasing. So that's uh, how that uh, influences fluidity. A second major factor is whether or not the lipids are unsaturated or saturated. Now, the, um, the difference between an unsaturated lipid and a saturated lipid is based on um, the, uh, whether or not that hydrocarbon chain has double bonds or not. If it has double bonds, that makes it unsaturated because it has less hydrogen atoms than it, uh, than it could if it had no double bonds. Because of the chemistry of how those uh, lipids just function, unsaturated lipids are more fluid than saturated lipids. You can kind of see in this diagram, this is an uh, example of a membrane with unsaturated lipids. And the, the, because of those double bonds, there's like kinks in those tails. So they're not going to lie down entirely straight. On the other hand, when you have saturated lipids, they'll lie down more flatly, and they'll pack together more easily. The uh, the kinks in the in the hydrocarbon tails, when you have unsaturated, or when you have, yeah when you have unsaturated lipids, those kinks will prevent that membrane from packing down as tightly as it otherwise would. Now the the last uh, factor that influences fluidity is so important it actually deserves its own uh, little section. Uh, this is cholesterol, which is a, a steroid molecule, meaning it has four fused uh, rings of carbon and hydrogen. It's actually found only in animals. Um, and you may hear of, of cholesterol as a bad thing. It's kind of stigmatized by health professionals everywhere. But it's actually necessary and very essential in the right amounts. The function of cholesterol is to oppose the changes in fluidity due to temperature. Let me back up a little bit. When the uh, when the membrane gets hotter, like I said, those phospholipids will be moving around more. They'll be s switching places all over the place, but the cholesterol will get in its way, will prevent it from moving quite as fast as it might otherwise. On the other hand, when the temperature starts to decrease more, like I said, those, those phospholipids will want to pack down real tightly. The cholesterol will get in their way and prevent it from packing down as tightly, tightly as it otherwise would have. Because of this, cholesterol is sometimes known as a fluidity buffer, or uh, just, it kind of keeps the fluidity more stable. Now that we've talked about some of the basic properties of membranes, we're going to, have to, we're going to look into uh, why these properties are the way they are, and how they function uh, for the cell as a, for the membrane as a whole. So uh, the first thing we're looking at is membrane proteins, which, as the name suggests, are proteins that are associated with the membrane in some way. There's a few different ways that we can uh, classify membrane proteins, uh, but the main one we're going to look at is whether they're integral or peripheral. Now, an integral pro uh, protein has a section of it that's located inside the membrane on the, on this little um, hydrophobic region. So either of these two would be an integral protein. On the other hand, a peripheral protein is a protein that only exists on the periphery or outside of the membrane. It, it's still attached to the membrane, but it doesn't have an area on the inside. The reason these membrane proteins will, uh, will situate themselves in a specific way is because they're amphipathic, just like phospholipids that, like we talked about earlier. As you can probably, uh, as you can probably guess, the area that's on the inside of the membrane with all the hydrocarbon uh, tails of those uh, phospholipids is going to be um, hydrophobic, just like, those re just like that region. Where, on the other hand, the outside, uh, or the outer region of the uh, membrane proteins will be hydrophilic, just like the outside of the membrane. Now, there are many different functions of membrane proteins, uh, but these are some of the most important. The first one we're going to look at is transport, and uh, we're going to be talking about transport a little bit more uh, later on in our active transport and passive transport videos, uh, but that's one of the main roles of membrane proteins. Another one is enzymatic activity. In other words, membrane proteins will act as enzymes 
in order to catalyze certain reactions that go on in the cell. Next we have signal transduction and cell-cell recognition, which are uh, both involved in sending signals between cells and inside of a cell in order to allow different cells to communicate with each other and through each other. Last we have intercellular joining in which these membrane proteins will actually allow two cells to connect to each other physically and uh, be anchored to each other in some way. Mm. Lastly, we have two important components of the membrane, glycolipids and glycoproteins. Glyco mm. means carbohydrate, and each of these has a carbohydrate uh, portion attached to another uh, part of the membrane. A glycolipid has a carbohydrate, carbohydrate portion attached to a phospholipid, while a glycoprotein has that carbohydrate portion attached to a protein. Mm -hmm. These uh, both mainly function in cell, cell recognition and other things. Lastly, um, a transmembrane protein is a, membra is a membrane protein that actually has a portion on either end of the membrane. So that's one more uh, definition. So this is it for, uh, this is the last part of uh, membranes, but uh, we're going to look at how they're synthesized and different things that are secreted while enzymes are while the, uh, these membranes are being synthesized. So membranes are synthesized in the smooth ER. So that's the function of the smooth uh, endoplasmic reticulum. And because that membrane is constantly being synthesized, it allows membranes to grow in size. This is going to be important because in, in order for cells to grow in size, that membrane has to expand. Otherwise, it would just break. Uh, an important thing that we look at is the inside and outside locations and where they kind of uh, correlate to. The inside of the Golgi body and endoplasmic reticulum actually leads to the outside of the cell, while the outside, while the outside of the Golgi body and endoplasmic reticulum leads to the inside of the cell. You can kind of see in this diagram, the area that's on the inside on the red is going to lead to the outside on the red. And it's actually, it's kind of interesting that they it goes from the inside to the outside or from the outside to the inside. I just think that's cool. So that's it for uh, membrane uh, structure. It's as simple as that.